1 Thessalonians. We will be doing, looking at different texts through the book of 1 Thessalonians, four particular texts in this book. So you just have to have your Bibles open here. We'll read them as we come to them. I want to open with some prayer this morning. Father, you are God, you are good. You are holy and righteous and true in all your works. And there is nothing that has demonstrated your righteousness, your justice, your love and your mercy more than the cross. And there is nothing that has demonstrated your victory and your power and your sovereignty more than the resurrection. And yet we wait for more. There is more. And we long for that day when you will bring us safely home. Father, I ask that you would bless your people today your people who have gathered in your name to hear your word, to worship you, the resurrected Lord, your son Jesus. Father, as we gather to worship your son, I pray that you'd bless your people with this truth of your word. You would encourage us, you would challenge us, you would convict us, and yet you would cause us to rejoice in Jesus today. Please remove distractions, distractions of poor health, mental frustration, maybe of the emotional mourning today, or perhaps the anticipation of a difficult week. Remove these distractions, please, and cause us to focus on the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Help us to focus on Jesus today. It is through and for and by him We gather and we pray and we preach and we sing. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, the Son of God, died for our sins as predicted. He was buried as proof of death. Three days later, he rose from the dead as predicted. He was seen by many people as proof of life. This is God's good news. This is it. Rest your hope in this. Rest your hope in this. But the resurrection of Jesus is not the culmination of the gospel. The death and resurrection of Jesus is not God's good news finished, complete, done, It is the entrance into good news. There is more yet to come. The proposition that I wish to encourage you with today is simply this. The certainty of Jesus' visible bodily resurrection provides full assurance of the visible bodily return of that same Jesus to dwell with his people. And there are three particular texts in the New Testament that connect directly the assurance of the bodily resurrection with our assurance of a bodily return. The first one is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28. I'm just going to read these three texts. These aren't our primary texts for today. This is what it says. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Very clearly, Christ rose, Christ is coming. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. We wait for the son from heaven because 
he was raised from the dead. And then finally, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 14. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In each of these three texts, you see a very clear connection between the resurrection of Jesus in a visible bodily way and the coming of Jesus in a visible bodily way. It's similar, although not the same word used, in Acts chapter 1 verse 11, where we find there the angel speaking to The disciples who have witnessed now the resurrected Christ and now have seen him ascended to heaven. And the angel angel says, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, that means this visible bodily resurrected Jesus who was taken up from you will so come in like manner, visibly and bodily, as you saw him go into heaven. Essentially, the bodily resurrection means a bodily return. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. Jesus is returning. That is the culmination of the good news. When he returns. When he comes again. There is a term that you can look it up in Webster's Dictionary. You can find it in there. It's in English, although it's a transliteration of the Greek language. There is a word that some of you may be familiar with, others may not, and yet it is an important term, an important vocabulary term, similar to other words that we describe in Christianity that we need to have in our theological vocabulary, our Christian words. We talk about the word like justification or propitiation, and we do have to explain those and define those. And there's another word that I think needs to be added to those lists of these are essential words for Christians to know. And that word is the word parousia. It's a transliteration, as I said, of the Greek word parousia. That's the word. What does it mean? It means arrival, presence, often translated coming. In 1 Corinthians 15, that's the word used there. Those who are at Christ's parousia. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 14, it says, We who are alive will remain until the coming, the parousia of the Lord. It was a word that was used in a non-technical sense throughout the classical time period and throughout the Bible to simply means the arrival or the presence of someone. Paul the Apostle uses it in 1 Corinthians to be thankful that Fortunaeus and Stephanus are coming to see them. They're they're coming, the parousia, they're, they're coming to them. It often was used as the arrival of official arrival, a, a noble arrival of a king or someone very important. The, and it became a very much a noun, the parousia of the king, the coming of the king, the arrival of the king, the presence. But it's interesting, a lot of these sort of words, when they were used in the New Testament, they became more than non-technical. The word parousia in that first century became an almost exclusive Christian word in normal, classic, everyday use. In other words, in that first century when a non-believer, a non-Christian would talk about the parousia, the first definition, if they had dictionaries, the movement to the first position was the promised return of the Messiah, the parousia. Kind of like the word ecclesia, which means church. Originally just meant an assembly, but before long it became a religious assembly, a Christian assembly, the ecclesia. The same thing with the word parousia. It became a Christian word because it was one of the most important features, one of the most important celebratory facts of the early church. They didn't just preach the death of Christ. They didn't just preach the resurrection of Christ. They equally preached the parousia of Christ. The return of Christ. And they expected the parousia at any time. A couple of important principles about this term. Because it's going to be the theme of the sermon this morning. 
The word parousia always means, in its technical or non-technical sense, always means physical, visible, bodily presence. It never meant sort of a metaphorical, I'm with you in spirit. Never meant that. In fact, the word parousia is never used for the presence of the Holy Spirit with us. Though that is a wonderful reality, that's not what the word meant. It didn't mean that he's with us in spiritual sense. It always meant a physical face-to-face meaning. When the non-technical use of it, they'd say the king is coming, the parousia of the king. They didn't mean, oh, he sent his ambassador or he sent a representative. They meant the king physically is going to be here, the presence of the king. One, it was always physical, visible, bodily. And two, it's not just describing, the word is not just describing one event. The best translation of the word is the word presence. When people talk about the parousia or the return of Jesus, almost always the mind goes to Revelation 19, which is probably the most powerful and demonstrative expression of the parousia. The return of King Jesus on a white horse with flaming eyes and a sword to bring judgment and righteousness and justice. That is the parousia. But the parousia is more than just Revelation 19. In fact, the word is used throughout the New Testament to refer to an, the actual, the entire economy of Christ's presence on earth since his ascension into heaven. So, it's, think of it like acts in a play. The parousia is a three-act event. The return of Christ is a three-act event. It begins, yet to be for us, with the resurrection of our bodies. The resurrection of believers, dead and alive, and the physical arrival of Jesus. That's Revelation 19. That's Act 1. Act 2 is then the presence of God in judgment on earth, the great white throne judgments, as it's called, and the proof of his divine reign, his divine kingdom here on earth, is the second act, sometimes called the millennial kingdom. And the third act is his final act of parousia, And that is when he newly forms the heaven and the earth and this new city of God comes out of the eternal heavens and resides forever on earth, the new Jerusalem as it's called. So there's three acts to the parousia. It begins with the dead rising. It begins with the living rising to get new bodies and Christ's return to the earth. It then continues with his rule, his his divine proof of kingship and judgment over the unbelievers. And it ends with the eternal state of being forever face to face with God. Now, faithful Christians, they debate the details of these three acts. And they, and they debate when it's going to happen and, and what must come first and all these things, and they're still faithful Christians. But no faithful Christian debates the physical arriving presence of Jesus. The human face-to-face meeting that is coming. It is as essential to the gospel as the death and resurrection of Jesus. Face-to-face. That's the concept here. Human face to human face. Sons of Adam face to face with the Son of God. That's the idea of the parousia. While we find this event or multiple events in one concept throughout the New Testament, there is one book of the Bible that the entire purpose of that book is to describe that word parousia and to teach us that word parousia. And it's not the book of Revelation. In fact, little note if you care about these sort of nerd sort of word things like I do, the word parousia is not found even once in the book of Revelation. Um, Even though it's everywhere there, the concept of it, the word isn't. But there is a word that repeats itself as the theme of the book, and that is this book of 1 Thessalonians. It's all about this parousia, this coming, this presence of Jesus the King. 
And so this morning, I'm going to do something I don't usually do in a sermon, and that is that I'm going to basically give an overview of the book of Thessalonians. Specifically, trace the four times that this word is used in the book, because it's used on four different occasions. Interestingly, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. Once each time, and it's the theme of each one of those chapters. And so essentially, Paul the Apostle is writing this letter to this church at Thessalonica, and he's writing this letter, and he's saying, good news, the presence of Jesus is soon coming. Good news, the presence of Jesus will soon be here. And he wants to encourage this dear church concerning the presence of Jesus. I just want to say a quick note. The context of 1 Thessalonians, the encouragement regarding the parousia, the coming, the presence of Jesus Christ, this is for those who believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The encouragement is for those who believe those two things. Might I say that the fact of Jesus' return, the fact of his presence, matters to everyone whether they believe or don't believe. Because our belief does not change facts but whether his return will be a moment of joy and encouraging then and today or a moment of dread and terror is another matter. For those who do not believe in the resurrected Christ, the crucified, resurrected, returning Christ as their only hope in life and death, then a better text I would suggest you turn to and read this afternoon is Revelation 19. Revelation 20, describing what you will experience when the king comes. But for the believer, for the Christian, the lover of God's truth, Thessalonians is masterful in encouraging us. The context of this letter is fascinating. There is no other New Testament Pauline letter that expresses such effusive praise for the church. Um, Philippians is really interesting and filled with joy. I would say it's second, the book of Philippians, with the joy that Paul the apostle had for God's people. But it it still is nothing compared to Thessalonians. Nearly one-third of this entire five chapters is devoted to Paul basically telling the church how awesome they are, how impressed he is with them, how amazed he is with them. I mean, and that's unusual because Paul, the apostle, really was Christ-centered in everything. And it is Christ-centered praise. But he is just overwhelmed with love and joy and delight in this church. Particularly for three reasons. One, they had a ready faith. They believed the gospel immediately. They didn't, they didn't doubt it. They didn't, they didn't wonder. They, they, they searched the scriptures like the Bereans. They both searched the scriptures but, but these individuals, they believed it. They had a ready faith. They had a holy living. In fact, in the first chapter, he says that from you has gone out into all of Macedonia. And that's the entire Greek region, the entire um, countryside. Your faith and your holiness that you love God and you love the, God's people and particularly says, and that you wait for his coming. It's gone out, everyone knows. He said, you turn from idols to the true God. Without, just, you did it, it just happened. And so he is extremely rejoicing in that. He spends the first chapter basically just saying that. <clears throat> and in the second chapter, he describes his relationship to them. He says, I was like a mother and like a father to you. I nurtured you and I taught you. And you were like amazing children to me. You received it. And he spends the most of the second chapter talking about that. And then you get into the third chapter and he says, and I was so distraught of being separated from you that I couldn't contain myself anymore. And so I had to send Timothy to see if everything was okay. And he spends half of the third chapter talking about how relieved he is that Timothy came back and said they're doing well. So it's just a unique book. It's, it's this effusive praise. And one thing that comes crystal clear from reading the book of 1 Thessalonians is that, is that Paul felt 
literal pain at the thought of being absent from these people. He suffered because he couldn't be with them. Now, why couldn't he be with them? Well, most likely we understand he was in prison for preaching the gospel. And so he can't be with them. And he longs to be with them. But what gave Paul the apostle comfort as he's sad and alone and in prison was the parousia. That's what encouraged him. That's what comforted him. The first instance of using the parousia is found in chapter um, 2, verses 17 through 20. Turn there, and you see kind of, I hope I gave that sort of intro so you can see what he's getting at. Verse 17, he says, But we brothers, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, that word in presence there is the word prosopon, face. It's the word face. Having been taken away from you in face, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. Boy, do I wish that Christians today around the world had that sort of desire (laughs) that believed that when they were absent from the family of God, it was a hindrance of Satan. He believed that. And and he's actually in prison for preaching the gospel. So it's the Lord that actually led him there. But he says, anytime I can't be with my church family, it's satanic. It's a work of Satan. That's another sermon altogether. And what does he say in verse 19 though? So for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you... In the presence, once again, that's the word prosopon, face. In the face of our Lord Jesus Christ at his parousia, at his presence. For you are our glory and joy. See, I wasn't kidding when I said that he had effusive praise. He calls this church family his glory, his joy, his hope, his crown. You are my crown of rejoicing. And he's saying this, and I can't see you face to face. I can't be there. And there is nothing I want more than this. But one day, one day, I will see you face to face. I will see your face at the parousia, the presence of Jesus. Principle number one about the Prusia and encouraging Christians is that the Prusia of Jesus anticipates the bodily, exultant, forever fellowship of God's redeemed people. The most remarkable thing about the resurrection and the return of Jesus is indeed beholding the face of Jesus forever. But the second most remarkable thing, and the thing that comes right up next to that, is the anticipation that we will see Jesus' people's faces forever. If there is any lesson from 2020, as difficult as it has been, is that there is no such thing as virtual Christian fellowship. We were created to live, to weep, to laugh, to worship together. And yes, at times we are required to be apart for different reasons. But we sense now more than ever, at least I do, the words of the apostle here. So I thank God for 2020. It taught me something I think I needed to to learn. To regard you as my glory and joy. For you to regard one another as your crown of rejoicing. In face-to-face fellowship, which we can't always have here, but we will always have there in his coming, in his presence. 
You see, it may be a silly, trite statement, but I think Paul would agree. For the Christian, goodbye is always see you later. It's always what it is. So what do we do in light of this? How does this encourage us now? One, anticipate the coming face-to-face fellowship with God's people now. Anticipate it. Regard one another as our glory and joy. Be present, be real, be gracious. And be able to be regarded as others' glory and joy. It goes both ways. In your presence, in your face. Perhaps this is why so much of the New Testament speaks of the Christian's relationship with one another. So many of the apostles' letters have this idea of like be, be gracious to each other, forgive one another, love one another, be humble, be submitted. All these, every book that Paul wrote, he adds this section on there. Perhaps it's because he's saying, this is what you're going to be forever. Start now. Live together as Perusia people in light of the glorious reunion that we will experience. This is principle number one of the parousia as we trace that word through Paul's work here in the text. The second time he uses it in chapter 3. Look at verse 11. Let me set up these three verses here very briefly. Basically what he does here in these verses, in this chapter, is he says, I said before, I I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't see you because I'm in prison, so I sent Timothy. He came to you. He said, hey, they're doing well. He reported to me. That's a relief. It's not good enough, but it's good enough for now. I'm glad for this. But, I, but Timothy, when he brought word to me about you, it encouraged me to pray for you. And this is my prayer for you. This is Paul's prayer for the people he longs to see. He says this, Now may the God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. He, he literally says, I want to come to you. And the, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God. If you didn't catch it already, that word before is the word face, in the face of. Our God and Father at the coming, the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. The parousia, the coming of Christ, not only motivates or anticipates us to enjoy the fellowship of God's people, it also motivates blameless holy living in the waiting. Motivates blameless holy living in the waiting. This is his prayer. He wants the parousia, the coming, the presence of Christ, the promised presence of Christ to establish them as blameless in holiness at the parousia. What does he mean by that? He wants, when he returns, he wants everyone in the church, in God's people, to not be ashamed at Christ's coming. To be at that day already established in holiness. I think a lot of Christians kind of look to the parousia, the return of Christ, as this sort of extra credit for their lives. And just kind of live their life how they want and say, you know what, it all gets sorted out at the return. I figure, I figure he'll fix me then. Um, thank God I'll be glorified then, so really what, what's the worry about now? I can't explain this fully, but there's enough text like this one that I think I can say with confidence in the word of God that the proportion of our faith, love, and holiness in this life will somehow be reflected in the life to come. How sweet Jesus is to you now will matter to you when he arrives. It will matter to you. I don't know how it will matter to you. I don't understand how it all works, but there's enough text in Scripture to say it matters. There is enough scriptural evidence evidence to conclude that at the appearance of Jesus, some will experience severe shame, even though they are believers. 
and others will be unashamed because they have lived in love and holiness. If there's nothing else you take from this principle we find in this prayer of Paul, it is simply this. Beloved, the sweeter Christ is to you today, that much sweeter he will be in the parousia. The sweeter he is today, that much sweeter he will be to you in his presence. Don't waste your life with this world. Don't waste your life with the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life. Live in love, blameless in holiness, in preparation for the arrival of your king, who is perfect love and holiness himself. Principle number two, the prusy of Jesus motivates us to blameless, holy living now. Principle number three comes in a chapter four, a little bit longer extensive reading of a text here. And there's a lot here. Verse 13. But by the way, what he does in chapter four, if you're interested, I'm trying to give an overview here. Then he talks about what love is. Genuine love. It's not, not erotic, it's sacrificial. That's what he describes in chapter 4 then, what that love he wants us to live in now is. But then chapter 13, he says this, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. That's just a term for those who have died. A term used for Christians. They've fallen asleep. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again... <coughs> Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that, the, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, that's the word parousia, until the parousia of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So there's a couple of things about this that are interesting that we just have to pull out. First of all, what he is saying is that the parousia, the return of Christ physically and bodily, coincides with the physical and bodily resurrection of Christ's people. And the way it seems to be is that those who are in Christ who have died when he comes, when he returns, they will rise and receive resurrected bodies. And it seems that those who are alive, they won't die first and then rise again. They'll simply receive the resurrected bodies immediately as well at that time. Now, this word there, caught up or catching up, um, often there's a word you may have heard if you've read literature out there called the rapture. Uh, that's the Latin equivalent of the word here, the catching up. And what he's essentially saying is, is this. Death cannot stop your face-to-face -face meeting. It cannot stop it. This is one of those, interesting, it's one of the few texts in the whole Bible that speaks of this catching up or this rapture, and yet it has, this concept has caused massive debates in Christianity, and yet it's, it's not a very, this is, this is about all there is. There's a few other texts, but this is the most explicit one. And there's a lot I don't know about this, and I am uncertain about, but it seems to be from the text that this catching up, this resurrection of those dead in Christ is a part of the parousia, because he says, he uses that very word to describe it. The catching up is a part of the parousia, at the coming. At the coming, there will be this catching up. And a lot of people kind of get into this and they start talking about the rapture and what's going to happen and when it's going to happen and what must happen first and, and all these sort of things like that. And that's a fun and interesting things to study. And 2 Thessalonians talks a little bit more about that. And there's a lot we could do about that. But what I found interesting is his reason for writing it here. His reason for writing it is not actually, and this is actually a general rule for eschatology, eschatology things, the end times things. God did not give us these things so that we could make charts that wasn't why he did it. He did it so that we could do what he says here, comfort one another with these words, right? To encourage the hearts. And the idea here of this whole catching up is simply this. Don't worry. Those whom you love, who have died in the Lord, 
they're not going to miss it. They'll go too. In fact, they get to go first. The dead will rise first. But don't worry, not just the dead. You'll go too. The comfort that he's speaking of coincides in verse 18 with what he said in verse 13. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. In other words, the whole point of this is it's different than the first point. He's talking about how when we go, when we, when we cannot be together in our presence, rejoice, one day you will be together in the presence of Jesus. But then there is that final departure, isn't there? Isn't there that final departure that we all sort of anticipate but we don't necessarily want where we bury our loved ones where we know that that tells us we too will be buried most likely someday and doesn't death seem unconquerable I mean Benjamin Franklin said there's nothing more certain in the world than death and taxes and it's proven true I enjoy sports, and they talk about this phrase with superstar or great athletes who, um, they say, father time is unbeatable. In other words, at some point, they can't do what they once did, and death is, is undefeatable. But you know what the parousia of a resurrected Jesus means? That death is not as undefeatable as we once thought. Death will be swallowed up in victory. And it is at the coming of the Lord, it is at the parousia when we will finally fully realize this. Understand, the comfort he's speaking of here is not just that when your loved ones in Christ die, they go to heaven. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the resurrection, the parousia, the coming the physical, bodily presence of Jesus. Death is not undefeatable. The parousia of Jesus comforts us even in the face of death. Do not fear death. Do not fear death. Nor mourn too deeply the death of those in Christ. That's what he says in the text here. It doesn't say we don't sorrow. We sorrow not as those who have no hope. We sorrow, but not too much. Not too deeply. Because the dead will rise in Christ. Death is the enemy. It is the ultimate expression of rebellion against God. It is the curse that God has laid upon sinful man since Adam. But since God laid the curse of death on man in judgment for sin, God has chosen to be the one to deliver man from that curse and the curse of death. The resurrection, the parousia, defeats death and gives us comfort. Principle number three. Principle number four, now, the final one, actually comes in the chapter five, the final use of this word parousia, at the very end, and it actually is Paul the Apostle's benediction at the closing of the letter. Verse 23. Here's his final blessing to the church. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming, the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just in case you doubted, he who calls you is faithful. Who also will do it? The last words in this letter, now it's interesting, you actually find a second Thessalonians, right? So it's not the last words of Paul the Apostle to the Thessalonians. He writes again. But the reason he writes again is is kind of interesting. He says, now there's been some confusion about this parousia in my first letter. 
So I'm going to clarify a few things for you. We won't get into the, that aspect of it today. But his, what he thinks to be his last words regarding the parousia before he has to add some clarifications. May God establish your hearts. Remember that was what we read before, right? May God sanctify you here. May God establish your hearts in the first prayer. Blameless in holiness in light of the parousia. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May you be preserved blameless at the coming. So it's very similar, right? A very similar idea. The, the parousia not only motivates us, but then we anticipate or we, we are assured that God will do what he calls us to. I love that part where he says, sanctify your whole spirit, soul, and body. There is so much in the New Testament that describes that this body, as frustrating as it can be to me, this me, this who I am, mind, my body, who I am, is actually since I've been born, an eternal feature. Now, some of you might think, I don't like the fact that this body is an eternal feature that is going to last forever. But that's why we just read it a minute ago. There's a resurrection. There's a fixing of this body. But this body, you understand that. It seems to be from the text of Scripture that when we gather together in the resurrection, we're going to recognize each other. We're going to be us. This is why Christians biblically have a high view of the body. And we care about things like the biological sex and gender of individuals. We care about those sorts of things. We care about preserving. We care about taking the life of innocent children in the womb. We care about those things because we believe that God gave us these bodies, not as just as we often use it. And I know that it's to comfort ourselves, but I think it's incorrect to say, oh, that's just their shell. Well, that's just the covering. He says, may God sanctify your body. In the coming, your whole body. Because this matters. And he's going to make it perfect. And he's going to destroy all the things that are the remnants of the curse, all the death inducing things that it's there. All the heart diseases and the cancers and all those things, they're, they're no longer going to be a part of it. But it's still me. And it will be me forever, just like Jesus' body was still his when she, held, when, when she grabbed a hold and the disciples grabbed a hold of him and held on to him with their hands touching him and his hands touching them as they embraced in resurrection, his resurrected body. So we and our bodies will embrace one another, but most importantly, we'll embrace Jesus. Now God preserve, he says, your whole spirit, soul, and body blameless. Now, did you notice the language of completion in here? Did you notice he says, may God sanctify you completely. And then he says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body. And then finally he says, he who, call, he who is faithful, who calls you is faithful, he will do it. The true child of God, the saint of God, one saved by the grace of God and redeemed by his sacrifice cannot miss the parousia. Cannot miss it. Why? Because Jesus will fulfill the covenant of election he has decided for you. Because he will finish what he started. Doesn't Paul the Apostle say that the one who began the good work in you will complete it until when? The day, the parousia of Jesus Christ. He will fulfill his promises. There is no doubt. There is no perhaps. There is no, no we'll see in the heart and mind of Jesus. There is only faithfulness. That is it. And are we not surrounded by unfaithfulness? The unfaithfulness of loved ones? The unfaithfulness of elected leaders? 
the unfaithfulness of friends and family, and the unfaithfulness of our own hearts. And yet we have a Lord and God whose primary characteristic is his faithfulness. What I mean is it's a primary characteristic. It's what the entire Bible is about. He made promises. He fulfills promises. He is faithful. He will do it. Christian, beloved, God has called you. He has chosen you. Christ died in your place. Jesus bodily rose as proof. Because of all this, Jesus Christ will certainly return. And at his arrival, at his presence, you will be resurrected. Yes, this very body, but better. And you will face to face enjoy the presence of Jesus and Jesus' people forever. That's the encouragement of the parousia. So this Easter, we look back at the resurrection. And I hope to say this in a respectful way, but it is only a glance back. Because as soon as we look back at the resurrection, immediately we are encouraged to look forward to the return, to look to the coming. Anticipate the reunion of resurrected saints. Be motivated for holy living in the now. Be comforted that death is powerless over you. And be assured that Jesus will return and he will present with you physically, bodily, be present with you physically, bodily to see, embrace, and enjoy forever. Christ is risen. And he is returning. Sola Deo Gloria.